Hello, everybody. Welcome to today's webinar. Um, just a little housekeeping before we get started today. Please make sure that you stay muted throughout the call. If you do have a question, you can feel free to drop it into the chat or you can raise your hand and we'll pause throughout the presentation to answer your questions live as well. At the end of today's session, you're going to receive a link to complete a survey. Uh, this should only take about five minutes of your time. As a professor founded company, we really value your feedback and look forward to responses. So if you could do that, that would be great. Today's session is being recorded and we will be sending out the recording later this week. Next slide. So my name is Michelle Sesniak and I'm the engineering marketing manager here at Zybook. I'm joined today by Professor Matthew Liber Liberatore, who is the author of our material and energy balance is Zybook. Next slide. For those of you unfamiliar with Zybooks, as I mentioned earlier, we are a professor founded company. Professor Frank Vahid, whom you see here on this slide, was having a hard time getting his students to read and stay engaged in his class. Therefore, his students were having a hard time succeeding in his class. So he came up with the notion of an interactive online platform, excuse me, that allows students to learn by doing. He partnered with Smita Bakshi and they created Zybook. So after launching the new learning platform in his classes, Frank saw student performance increase by 16% and letter grades improved by two, sometimes even three levels. Frank's least prepared students improved by 64% when using Zybooks as their learning platform, which is pretty incredible. Since 2012, over 900 universities and colleges across the country have adopted Zybooks to transform their STEM education. Next slide, please. The Zybooks vision is less text, more action. Zybooks are web native interactive textbooks that help students visualize concepts to learn quicker and more effectively than with a traditional textbook. Concepts are brought to life through extensive animations that are embedded into the interactive content and learning questions help to reinforce these key concepts. Our continuous publication model allows us to make updates to our content easily and often to stay up to date with the latest content and technology. So now I'd like to turn it over to Matt, who's going to walk you through the material and energy balances Zybook, how he's using it to teach his course and what he's found along the way. Over to you, Matt. Thank you, Michelle. This is a great opportunity. It's good to see some familiar faces and names. I guess not faces, mostly names in the attendees list. And so um, yeah, I'm excited to, to tell my story um, of creating the Material Energy Balances iBook. Today, we're going to use a slideshow with some, some screenshot movies and, and show you the different features. And, and, and I'm going to, at the end, talk a little bit about the findings. And so I've done a lot of research. We just published a new paper this week that I'm super excited about that took many years, probably more years than any of my, uh, my technical lab-based rheology papers to do. Um, and, and I'm, I'm happy to, to talk more about that in, in other contexts and throughout. And so um, let's jump in. Uh, we'll start with what we do as engineers, uh, start with a safety moment. So like I said, there's research at the end and that's, uh, you know, could be considered human subjects research. So there's IRB protocols here at the bottom of the slide. There's going to be a couple of mentions of, of uh, YouTube problems or other things related to the two NSF projects on the screen. And we've published a lot in this area. And so I just want to thank all of those uh, co-authors, especially of those publications uh, in research in this area um, that have led to uh, some, some, I think, neat advances uh, in the engineering education field, as well as, you know, people who've helped along the way, like teaching assistants and work-study students and, and others, too. All right, so who am I? Uh, my name is uh, Matt Liberatore. I'm a professor of chemical engineering at the University of Toledo, and uh, I have many interests. <laughs> and so some of those are pictured here on the slide. Um, starting on the, on the left there, you can see me walking on water, as we say, so the cornstarch and water um, uh, mixture that, that, that readily flows, but if you run, walk across it or run across it, you don't sink in. Um, and so you know, I'm a, I'm a rheologist, as I mentioned earlier, and so I study the flow of materials and have a laboratory and have been doing that for, for the 18 years of my career as a faculty member. That's the 18 at the bottom. Um, and I've done a lot of work um, on, on things like, like YouTube problems uh, with this reverse engineering engineering education YouTube channel, um, and then worked a lot in, in, the, in the 
uh, service space with the Society of Rheology, that Hourglass logo, as well as the ISAG Education Division. The trophy on the right, I actually have two of those trophies in my office. Those were earned by my students who won the Chemi Car Competition at the ASCHE National Meeting <laughs> two years in a row. So uh, this year's group feels a lot of pressure being that they're two-time defending champions of that uh, really stiff competition and great entrepreneurial group of students that have worked on the cars over the last couple of years. And finally, those other numbers at the bottom, uh, you know, just talking about faculty life and other things, you know, I, uh, the hundred was when I made the slide, how many publications I have now, I, I got another one this week. So that's ticked up. Um, 1400 is relevant to this talk, which is, you know, the number of students I've taught MEB uh, over the last 15-ish oh, years. Um, and then, you know, I'm not talking about the Thermo book, which Milo Koretsky and I co-wrote and is, is kind of newly released in the last year from Zybooks. And then the Spreadsheet Essentials book uh, is sold both standalone and as part of the MEB book. So I'll mention that a little more as we go along. So now that you know a little bit about me, what do I want to talk about today? I don't want to go too long. Uh, I think this is about a half hour, uh, so it's not a super long talk. There'll be uh, definitely points uh, after each of these kind of subsections of, of, of the slides to, to take questions if you have them. So feel free to put those in the chat. We're going to hit on learning and some of the learning theories that we base some of our authoring on at Zybooks. And then we'll talk, we'll, you know, we'll demonstrate the book in some in some movies and some slide uh, uh, within the slides. This is not like a, a demonstration per se, where I'm going to show you the live book. Um, I've, I've done that, and I do we do that a lot here at Zybooks, um, and that works really well when we're doing one on ones, but in a group setting here. I find the slideshow to be a little bit easier, and then we have just like a handful of slides at the end on the research and the findings. So my favorite thing, even though our tagline at Zybooks is less text, more action, my favorite way to frame this talk is, is that textbooks are a 20th century technology. And if you've been at, at, at any of my talks over, over the last few years on this topic, I'll, I'll usually ask the audience to, you know, call me on their rotary phone if, if they disagree. Um, and, and I usually get a few good chuckles uh, from the crowd on that one. But, you know, going from when we started to write things down thousands of years ago, the, the paradigm shift with the, with the printing press in the 1400s and, and just the 20th century, I mean, we've really only had textbooks and engineering textbooks for about 100 years. So from the greater scheme of things, um, you know, engineering textbooks is, is a somewhat new technology. Um, but today, you know, we're in a screen-based world, we're on a webinar, uh, and so, you know, Zybooks really kind of leverages the goods of the textbook with, with the goods of the technology, and, and, and so I'll show you what, what I've put together for that. So how do, how do we think about learning when we're writing these books, and why are they so different from a traditional textbook that you've probably used for your many or all of your, your engineering courses? So, uh, you know, I, I, I've condensed some of the, of the main ideas and frameworks and theories into, into this one three bullet slack here. So active learning is talked about a lot in engineering ed space, but it's almost always focused on what you're doing in class. And so I think the first philosophical difference between a Zybook and a traditional textbook is that we're bringing active learning outside of the classroom. So the students are actively participating in the book. And so that's through clicks. Okay. The other thing is with the screen based technology, as you're doing right now, is that we can have visuals, right? And you're going to see movies of animations and, and other things that we have in the book, and you have color and movement and, and other things that um, a static uh, printed book has never had or, or could not do or, you know, became very expensive to have any color in the books in, in recent years. And then finally, you know, nothing like, you know, it's lunchtime here on the East Coast where I live uh, uh, in Eastern time. So um, ha have some food in the talk, have a large piece of chocolate. That's always good to, to help uh, people people adjust when, when it's a virtual meeting, show them chocolate. Um, but the other idea here is called cognitive load theory. Um, and that's where we want to take our content, a 600 page or more textbook, 
and break it down into digestible chunks, as as the as the cognitive load theory calls it. And so I like the the chocolate analogy here, right? You could have the world's largest chocolate bar. I'm a dark chocolate fan, you know, but you can't eat it, but like one small piece at a time, right? So I think that that's a a good thing to keep in mind when you know we're authoring and using this technology. The other couple of slides we have on, on theory, just two more. One is about the 10,000 hours idea, right? We know that students in order to learn and become good engineers and problem solvers need to put in the time. Uh, Anders Ericsson, whose name is at the bottom here, um, the late researcher did a huge amount of study in this area and, and, and kind of quantified that number. But that all wraps around a, a whole um, series of, of best practices called deliberate practice. And so you see the four tenets listed here on the slide. And you know what we want, and I think what I've personally experienced, right, is that we want to have opportunities to practice and repeatedly practice. And, and when we're practicing, we want to know if we're doing well or not, right? Get that feedback. And then with you know, we're not doing well, we want to know, you know, what the good person is doing correctly and how how we can how we can mimic and and incorporate their ideas into our into our um, our solutions and our activities and so um the final one is the formative assessment right so we've been moving and i think active learning and flipped classrooms have pushed us more in that direction is that having things that give you benchmarks along the way are so important um, and not just being a single, um, what would I say, you know, a single final exam to determine if you, you know, pass or failed the class. No, we, we, we usually divide it up into many exams or many quizzes and exams or, or many small projects along the way. And I think that those are all good learning things. And then our, our last, um, our last slide about, about learning is about scaffolding. And so that's our way of thinking about going from easier easier to more difficult. And what we found in the engineering ed literature is that this is good for you know, making ideas stick, as they say. So going from your short-term memory to longer-term memory and, and, and really in, in internalizing your new problem-solving knowledge. And so here I like to you know, pull in analogies, right? The sports analogy and the uh, music analogies are usually one of the two will resonate if not both with most people um for me i'm a sports person so like basketball is the one where the scaffolding analogy is is quite easy to talk about you know you need to dribble and pass you need to shoot free throws you know and build those individual skills up before you can start to do a three on three or a five on five or, or work together as a team while applying those skills of shooting a jump shot or, or getting a layup or, or or having a fast break those kinds of things and the music analogy is quite similar right we need to learn our our notes and our scales and 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 some of the basics of the music um before we can not only play a song by ourselves or or a whole or a whole suite of songs, um, but we can not play in a symphony orchestra, say, until we've done our basic due diligence and learned the basics of our instrument and how it plays into the bigger picture. So I think that scaffolding idea, you'll see that we have built into some of the exercises and, and some of the stuff we have in the book. All right, so how do we actually go about doing this? So the way I think about the sections, and I'm gonna demonstrate this in a few slides, is that they're broken in each each section of the book is modular and can be moved around and we'll talk about that a little more as we go and when i when i author a section or a subsection i, I try to do these four things i try to define the new concepts or ideas and we do that with text so there is text i'm not going to show you slides of text um, and so there are you know key terms that are bold and searchable and, and everything you'd expect out of out of a digital technology and then once we've defined uh, something with, with small amounts of text, we demonstrate it in animations. I'll show you a bunch of those. Then we go on to practicing where the students go through a set of learning questions, you know, digging deeper into the concepts that have just been introduced. And then finally, we kind of take, take, um, take the onus and put it on the students and challenge them to apply that in some way with some auto-graded uh, challenge activities. So I'll show you what those are also. 
Okay. So where is the MEB Zybeck as of early 2023 uh, as we're doing this webinar right now? Right now we're up to 86 sections. We just pushed two new sections in the spreadsheet chapter. So I'm excited about those because I just wrote those in the last few months. Um, and so uh, plenty of content, appendices, data, uh, you can see over 150 animations and uh, 700 autograded problems. And so we'll talk about what that really means and how many problems there are in the book that so many you can't count. Um, but the thing I want to point out here in the table is that the 1400 clicks to read the whole book, um, I, when I teach MEB, which is most spring semesters, um, I do assign all nine chapters, all 80, what used to be 84 sections, now I guess it'll be 86 next time I teach it, um, to my students. And, and you'll see my click rates are, are very, very high in, in terms of the reading. And so all 1400 interactions are recorded and we have those uh, and give them a little incentive, a little grade for that. All right, so let's, let's talk about, uh, you know, the reading participation and what we do there. Um, the first thing, after we define a term, there's different types of animations that we build in. The first one here I'm showing you is a derivation. So what we see is you hit the start button and then, um, you know, a bunch of the screen clears. And then in this case, a bunch of equations start to show up and start to get manipulated and moved in a series of steps. Here, the five different steps require the student to click each time. You can see that there's a 2x speed button if they want to speed up the activities. And you can see it's relatively fast at a 2x speed. It's a little bit slower at the 1x speed. We're actually doing some, some that's one of the NSF projects right now. We're looking at analytics related to the 1x and 2x and how long students kind of dwell and sit and watch these animations. The other nice part about the animations is, is a way that we can take less text and, 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 and build text in in a, in a, in a chunked way, right? In, in, a, in a very amenable way. The, the captions for each of the steps is only two lines long. And this is a, a strategic uh, pedagogical and technological um, both advantage and, and limitation of the animations. And so we have to focus our text to describe what happens in, in each step of an animation in just two lines, right? It's about one to two sentences. And so uh, derivations take a whole chunk of text usually in a traditional textbook and break it into these smaller, more uh, easily digestible and I think understand or understandable uh, way for, for a learner. Then we can not only take big blocks of text and, and turn them into animations like with the derivations, but we can take all of the figures and not only we can we you know make sure everything is color and interesting, but we can actually use the animation to build the figure that's just static in a, in a traditional textbook. So here we have you know kind of a PV type diagram where we're looking at uh, subcooled liquids, superheated vapors, and two phase regions. <clears throat> And you can see here we use, you know, something like an orange dot that moves around to emphasize different pieces and parts of the phase diagram. And then here we're labeling which diagram you're wanting to look at um, to get different properties like specific volumes. And so figures and plots and derivations are two of the types of animations that, that tie back to, you know, very typical textbook type behavior. But what we also have are, are both conceptual and, and what I would call physical world animations. So here we're looking at a flash tank from the kind of pencil and paper kind of, of schematic or diagram perspective. Here the liquid goes in and it's just a blue box and the blue box splits into two different boxes, one of a darker blue and one of a lighter blue to show the liquid and the gas being formed. And so this now, a flash tank may be something the student in, in an MEB course has never even heard of. And now they can get a, a clear idea of what the physical process is when the pressure is decreased across that valve in a flash tank. Okay, so that gives a, a nice, simple, very clean, animation of a flash tank. We also have entire sections, and I think there's like 18 or 19 uh, process equipment sections or process unit sections, we call them. And then there, we usually have a little bit more detailed animation about equipment and how the physical world works. 
Here's the one related to flash tank where the liquid becomes vapor and bubbles go up and down and, and other things. Very simple still, but I think it, it, it starts to transition us from the conceptual drawing that's clear in most textbooks to the physical world. And then we also have pictures and safety moments in these sections that are, are, are been contributed um, by, by some collaborators in the industry. And, and so there's, there's some really neat ties between the kind of the theory and the practice uh, in the book uh, that we have. The last type of animation is, is spreadsheet related. I mentioned that at the beginning that we, the Zybook sells the spreadsheet content as its own kind of mini book, as well as as part of the MEB book. Here's one of the simplest well, early on animations for the spreadsheet book where we're defining the key term, uh, key terms of, of defining displayed content, what you see on the screen in the cells versus um, stored content where the formulas and functions go. Um, that are hidden from the from the eye, and what we what's different about the spreadsheet animations is not only is it its own chapter about how to use spreadsheets and, and apply a lot of the basic tricks of the trade that it, that engineers and chemical engineers use a lot, but I designed it as an educational tool, right? So it, these animations are not dependent upon. Excel or Google Sheets or, or Apple Numbers or whatever version of the spreadsheet you're using on a web, on, on an application, on a, on a PC or a Mac, it doesn't matter. Um, there's a lot of general skills in spreadsheeting that we can have an educational tool about. And so that's what we've been doing with the spreadsheets. There's also spreadsheet animations built into the MEB content where they're most useful. If you think about solving energy balances with NH tables, uh, you talk about finding heat capacities or enthalpies, those can uh, commonly and easily be done using spreadsheets and there's animations about those in the content. So once we've gotten through all those animations, um, and it's usually one or two in a in a sec in a subsection, uh, then we we kind of try to dig deeper by formulating learning questions we call them. And in the MEB book, most of those are true false multiple choice and matching. There's a handful of short answer ones. Those are all ones you'll see in other Zai books too. So I'm just going to demonstrate quickly two of those. The multiple choice and the true false are, are somewhat similar. Here, we have a short question statement. It's three lines about this heat exchanger process flow diagram and writing balances. This is early on in chapter two about the problem solving. And then you can click the first answer, moles, and you see that it's incorrect. And there's a three line explanation about why moles is probably not your best choice. And then you might pick the next one, atoms. And then you see that that's also wrong, but it gives you a completely different explanation about why it's wrong, and it may also point you to the right answer. And then finally, there's the correct answer and an explanation on why it's correct. So as the author, these are a huge pain in the butt, right? This is hard to do, right? Not only do I have to write multiple choice questions, I have to not only pick good uh, distractors or, or wrong choices, I have to explain why they're wrong and, and hopefully encourage the students to, to build uh, you know, to break down misconceptions and to learn new things and tie that new knowledge together. Um, so the next one is learning by doing with a matching exercise. And so here the matching exercise is a, is a PXY diagram and three different points on it. And then we have to figure out which is the bubble, which is the dew point, which is in the liquid phase, you know. So you drag these around and when you get them right, um, it gives you a little bit more explanation. And again, you see, it could be as many as three lines of text, but not a super large amount of that. And so the students can hit reset. They can do these multiple times. And sometimes they do. We haven't looked uh, deeply into the rewatching of the, uh, or the redoing of, of learning questions like matching, but we have looked at rewatching of animations. And I'll mention that later on too. So let this, loop one more time, you see the little orange check in the upper right, that's their reading participation check, so they get their points for that. So I'm going to pause now uh, before we jump into the auto grade questions, as I see there's a, a question in the chat. Um, are there plans to get um, script style rather than spreadsheet style solution problems in the book, like Python rather than Excel? 
Uh, that's a good question. I've I've actually had that question um, by other other uh, other faculty too. Um, right now, the book is I think not as much focused on on spreadsheet style solutions um, as much as um, doing a lot of the the development of the material balances and the energy balances and the equations by hand. Right, writing down those balances and getting them right is central to the 12 steps of problem solving that we use um, throughout the entire book. And so I think that that's another differentiator between this book and other books for the course is that we have this 12 step problem solving method and that applies across the entire um, eight chapters of the MEB content. Um, in terms of the tools that we're using or, or demonstrating, yeah, we don't have anything like, like coding in Python like that in the book right now, but certainly it's not far from, you know, it wouldn't be difficult to start adding those kinds of things in the future. And as, as, as these, uh, these kind of, uh, I don't know if we would call them the requirements or, 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 or uh, shifts in, in, our, in, our, in our teaching of chemical engineering, I think that that's, that's gonna be an easy thing to transition to using this format being that we update a couple times a year. So with that, I'm gonna keep going and show the other side of the book, which is the uh, homework side. So we all like giving homework because we know that's where the, where the, where the reading, or not where the reading, where the learning occurs, right? Because this is where the students are doing a deep dive. And I, I decided that creating a menu of what I would want on a homework uh, in a textbook, uh, what would it have? One, of course, we want lots and lots of problems. And over the last eight years, I've built in many, many questions. I said there are 700 of the autograded type in the book and a couple hundred uh, static questions too. And we want to use the technology to give feedback and immediate feedback. And we'll show you what that looks like uh, here in the next couple of slides. And then the thing that I think is unique to the MEB Zai book that I haven't seen in other chemi or engineering books that I've, uh, textbooks I've used to teach over these last 18 years is that there's these formative or, or more single concept calculation type questions in each section that I call, um, that, that, that are called challenge activities that, um, in section or formative. It's not really how a lot of educators will use the word formative, but um, we're gonna use it here that way. Summative is more what we're used to in terms of homework. End of chapter questions that are paragraphs that have multiple ideas. So my students, when we have MEB class, we're gonna do both. We're gonna do formative questions every week, we're going to do summative questions every week. And so we're going to build up the, you know, using the sports analogy again, we're going to practice dribbling and passing as well as, you know, playing a game of basketball. All right. So what does an auto grade question look like? Here's one of the formative questions, but it exemplifies what an auto graded randomized question looks like. So here is a, is a question from the excess and limiting section. Um, and here you can see that not only do the numbers change and roll the flow rates and the amount, the percent excess, but the chemical reactions actually change. And so the stoichiometry changes. And so that changes, you know, how you go about solving and getting the right answers here. I call these perpetual practice. Um, we've done some research on, on attempts before correct as well as attempts after correct. And students use these for practice um, because they know they can go back to that question level that they might've struggled on. It may have taken two, three, four tries to get it right the first time. They are gonna wanna go back to that question and do to practice before the next quiz or exam. And when I teach the course, it's usually a weekly quiz uh, and then a few exams uh, instead of the weekly quizzes throughout the semester. All right, so what does the scaffolding look like? I mentioned that was one of our, uh, our pillars of, of, of in the learning section at the beginning. Here's uh, you know three of four levels. I think the fourth level is probably the last one in this one. That shows you we not only have single numeric uh, answer entries, and those have a tolerance in terms of grading. In the case of the stoichiometry for level one, the tolerance is going to maybe be zero or very, very small. Well, something where there's like a calculation in like level four, that's going to be the, the answer that's calculated by the by the algorithm that I wrote in Python, no less. Um, 
plus or minus a certain tolerance. And usually that tolerance is plus or minus two or 3% when it's in, in say the energy balance portion of the book, it's much bigger, right? We can't calculate a Q from a bunch of H calculations from a bunch of molar flow rate calculations without having a, a bigger window where we're rolling numbers in those. And so we can see then in real time over the first, say, three to six months that questions are out there if the tolerances aren't set right and we need to go back and look at those um, and adjust those. And we've done that a few times over the years, but not too often. It seems to be pretty good. And so here's, here's just an example of the different scaffolding levels and the different question types, single numeric, multiple numeric, and, and multiple choice are the three we most often do. So once they've done these kind of in-section scaffold and informative questions, then we do also have the end of chapter questions. Here, there's not going to be as much rolling content, but certainly rolling numbers and tens to hundreds to thousands of versions of, of almost every question in the book. Um, here, you need to answer three flow rates. Uh, correctly all at once to get through that first question level. And then what we do in that case, I want them to think about what they just did. And so we, we do what I call connected concept questions as the second level of these end of chapter summative type questions. And the connected concepts say the conversion of sugars uh, change in this case. You see the conversion of sugar is 61.8% in the last line of the question statement in the top. So I'm changing one number and asking the students, how does, a, how does one of the numbers you calculated, the flow rate of ethanol, which looks like it was N.2E in the, in the top part of the question, how does that change by changing the conversion, right? And all we're asking here is to select from the dropdown, increase, decrease, or stay the same. So it's qualitative, but we're gonna have to think about what the relationship between conversion and the flow rate is. And I think these are really important ideas to start making and building those connections uh, in our heads as, as a learner um, when, we're, when we're doing this type of MED material. And we also have uh, another unique flavor of end of chapter problems that are, are somewhat student written. Uh, these were all, uh, these are what we call YouTube problems and that reverse engineering, engineering education, as I mentioned, is our YouTube channel about YouTube problems. So if you don't know what they are and you wanna write, have your students write some, go there and watch the videos or, or get our papers or engage me at other times, we're happy to talk about those. But here you have the same idea where it's a, it's a you know, three answers at once, you have a whole block of text that you need to solve, but now you can click the link to the 100 tons of dynamite and watch a video for a minute or two uh, on something that happens in the physical world usually, and you're relating that back to whatever chapter of MEB you are working on. So it's a, it's a great real world phenomena tie uh, for, for the book uh, and some really unique and creative problems uh, that we've, we've added over the years to the, to the design book too. So with that, I'm, I get to the last part of the talk where we're, we're gonna show you just a handful of slides related to research, but I wanted to just point out some of the other um, features that I usually talk about when I'm doing demos and other things that you know each of the sections is, is configurable. So that means if you've taught the course before and many times and you have an order that you teach things in, you can just very quickly in, in five minutes configure the sections of the book uh, to be that way. Some faculty even reconfigure it in that, okay, they, these are the sections we're doing for quiz one or exam one, and these are the sections for quiz two or exam two, and they just arrange the chapters in that way. So there's lots of ways that, that faculty take the book and personalize it to, to their teaching style and their effort. It's easy to add the graders, TAs, tutors, um, and that's really helpful. Um, you know, when I have upperclassmen who might be AICHE or Omega Chi Epsilon who volunteer and tutor the, the freshmen that I teach MEB to, um, you know, it, it's nice to give them access to the book again, um, and you can do that. And then, you know, we have all of these analytics, the data, um, there's ways to have assignments and due dates and give extensions, things that you're, you're, uh, you're used to in your learning management system and other places. And um, a lot of places you can do single sign on and, and get to the book through uh, most uh, of the large learning management systems. You can customize the book with notes. Um, and so you can add little details within a section or you could add all new sections with your own content and your own text and your own uh, multiple choice questions and things. Those are available features that Zybooks has now. 
And of course, there's a there's a keep and take home version. That's always a question I get when I'm doing demos. So there's a print chapter button. Um, and so you can print the static version of each section and keep that and 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 have that perpetually um, as the, the sales model is a subscription base to have all of that interactivity and the grading and all of that together. So now let's wrap up with looking at the research and we've worked on research and two different paradigms, the same two paradigms I've been talking about, the reading at first and then the auto graded problems. So I, I always like to frame when I give uh, like seminars in, in, in chemi departments or in colleges of engineering like I've gotten to give over the last few years is how much do your students read? Uh, and I get a blank stare almost always and never audience uh, gets it. And I was like, what data do you have that, that that $200 textbook is being used? And no one has ever offered any data. I've asked people to send them me data and papers and, and I can't find any. And, and it's very, very limited. So this paper published in 2000, over 20 years ago now, was, was the most comprehensive study in terms of time. I always joke when I'm in a seminar with graduate students that I'm, I'm glad this wasn't my PhD project that took 16 years to complete. Um, and so here you can see the students in the early 80s, they were readers. And ever since then, you know, the reading bar is, is not really higher than 40%. Um, and so this is this is one set of data. There's some survey data at Indiana University, uh, much more recently in the last three to five years, they do it every year. That shows 20 to maybe as high as 50% do some reading um, of a textbook in, in a higher ed setting. So what does our data look like? Our data looks like this. It's on the left under interactive, where we kind of have a reading percentile. This is a box plot. So the bottom of the box is three quarters of the class. The middle is the median. The top of the box is the top quarter of the class. The triangles are the means. And what we see is that the boxes are, are in different stratospheres, to say the least, right? So if you did a t-test or any, any kind of statistical comparison, it would be statistically significantly different in, in a great way. Um, and so for us, we've collected data that's in this plot over seven uh, different cohorts, seven different years in my case, and almost uh, over 750,000 clicks have been, have been aggregated in that plot to compare with the traditional setting. And so hundreds of students, uh, it's just a different paradigm and different expectation. And I think that that's a really good thing. The other things that we've looked at in terms of reading participation, including is is you know how long students spend on the animations that we talked about just last year and we've talked some over the years about students having reruns re-watching the animations and so those are always interesting topics also to, to to talk about and think about yeah so our median reading rate most years uh, since the first year we did it is is 98 percent to 100 percent for at least half the class right and the, the animation view rate is 10% is, is more than everybody watching an animation once. And what we found is that even though reading is only 5% of their course grade in my case, and um, it's totally effort-based, that it correlates with their final grades that they earn on their quizzes and exams. And so that's, that's, that's a good thing to, to keep in mind. All right, so our last couple of slides, we look at auto grade problems and lots of metrics related to that instead of just looking at right or wrong, which is the traditional sense of auto graded homework. Um, we also look at attempts before the students get it correct the first time, as well as attempts that they do after they've gotten it correct the first time. We call those attempts after correct or practice attempts. And then finally, we have some new metrics. That was what this week's paper that we published uh, was about a new metric that combines both correct and attempts together. And so the, the only set of data I wanna show before we wrap up is this one, where we have correct on the left and some you know ANOVA statistics in, in orange there, showing that from the first question of, a, of those in-section formative exercises to the middle questions all aggregated together to the last question, you can see that the fraction correct goes down, the boxes go, you know, the median goes down and the boxes get wider and the, and the means uh, go down too. And you know the, the differences are statistically significant between each of those categories. But what we also see is that the amount of attempts it takes for the first questions versus the middle versus the last go up. Okay. And so both of these are, are the right signs, right? What we expected out of the scaffolding, but now we've measured it with real students in, in over, over multiple cohorts and, and ma massive data sets here. 
And so this is the, a paradigm shift in going from the expert author, me in this case, said these were the easy problems and these were the medium problems, these were the hard, I scaffolded them that way. And a lot of engineering textbooks have it where they're labeled as easy, medium, or hard, or some kind of, of designation in the book. But there's no way to prove the expert author right or wrong. And so now we've actually shown uh, quantitatively that we're on the right track, at least looking at it at different levels. And so just to wrap up, the data that we take is both effort-based for the reading, uh, those clicks, and as well as the right or wrong in the scaffolding uh, on the challenge activities. We don't, as a, as a paradigm in the Zybooks platform right now, there's no limit on the number of attempts. These are supposed to be formative exercises. So we don't wanna say the three strikes and you're out to use another sports analogy. Um, and just to give a little uh, glimpse of how I teach the class, and that's, you know, 5% of the, their final grade is related to those reading clicks, um, and 5 more percent related to solving correctly those challenge activities, no limit on the challenge activities. But I give a little bit of a fudge factor. I usually assign about 500 um, challenge activities per over the course of the semesters as, as pseudo required for their grade but I give them a fudge factor of 10 or 15 questions to get thrown away so that they don't stress if they don't get one specific question level and they can't come to office hours and, and ask us about them or, or things like that. And so with that, I'm just gonna put up this final slide, which has a, a few of the research take homes, happy to talk about features or other things um, and take questions about what we're doing. But I hope that, that you know, you're excited about MEB as much as I am. Uh, and that these uh, techniques uh, really focus on, on being student-centered and, and involving them and give them feedback the, all along the way. Great, thanks, Matt. So if anyone has any questions, feel free to raise your hand and I can take you off of mute so you can ask them out loud or you can continue to type in the chat if you're more comfortable with that. <clears throat> Yeah, I mean, I've had questions over the years related to, um, so how has your class changed since now they come to class so much more prepared? They know what all the definitions of the terms are and other things. I think that the way I've, I've, I've addressed that is, is I don't do too much lecture in class. I do a little bit of review and, and, and uh, you know, refreshing on the most important points or, or pull in a story about things. Um, but, uh, you know, we, we make class about integrating the ideas that they read about, you know, putting those definitions to work and, and problem solving. And I, I have them sit in, in, in groups and teams also. And so, the, you know, the class is quite active. The other thing that shifted in the paradigm over the last couple of years, especially once the book has been in use a year or two, is that we see that, um, the upperclassmen students, you know, look back and they, you know, uh, we always think the class we're in is the hardest class we've ever taken. And so, you know, when they look back and having taken, you know, two semesters of, of thermodynamics and, and other things, um, you know, they, they, they could, they, they like to tell the, the second semester freshman in my case that you got to do those reading clicks. You can't get, you know, you don't get points as easily as that in any other course ever. Um, so, so you create this culture of participation and engagement um, that's, that's pushed down from, from, from all levels uh, and from their peers. And so I think those have been some really good benefits of, of, of this kind of uh, a different perspective, in my opinion, on, on the flipped classroom. Yeah, that's a great point. Any other questions or comments for Matt today? All right. Well, thank you everyone so much for your time. Again, just a reminder that when we close out of today's session, you should get a survey that pops up. If for some reason you don't or you miss it um, or you close it by accident, we will be sending out a link to the recording. Um, and in that email will also be a link for the survey again. So thank you so much for all your time and uh, have a great day. Bye-bye.